The tower is populated by a wide variety of creatures. There are different races, human or not, animals, Shinhe, special cases, etc. And this is exactly what we are going to see today. Hi, it's Lillian, and we meet again for a new lore video about the living beings of the tower. We could first start with a little demographic point by trying to estimate the population of the tower. First of all, we know that there are about 100,000 rankers, but we don't know how many rankers existed in total. Indeed, there were inevitably deaths among the rankers, especially during the Genesis period when war was a daily occurrence, but given their greater than normal power, the relative stability of the tower since the age of coexistence, and also the fact that according to Hachai, they obtain eternal youth once they become rankers, the total number of people who have reached the 134th floor in history must not be much higher than 100,000. Then we are told from the first chapters that out of several tens of millions of regulars, only one or two will become ranker, the official French and English translations were wrong in speaking of thousands, and Electrica confirmed it by asking a Korean. Anyway, we can estimate by doing a simple multiplication with the number of ranker that there have been in total several thousands of billions of regulars in the history of the tower. And I speak in the past tense because among the regulars who did not succeed in becoming ranker, many probably died, either during the test to climb the tower or simply of old age, since I recall that the system of regulars has been in place for several tens of thousands of years. This low success rate is quite logical when you know that only about 15 regulars will be able to pass to the third floor, among the 800 participants of the two groups during the second floor tests in season 1, knowing that after that, there are 131 tests left, even if, unlike those on the second floor, they can be repeated as many times as desired. Then if we had to deduce the number of inhabitants of the tower from this estimate, it would simply not be possible since we do not know the proportion of non-regulars who become regulars, we only know that becoming a regular is already something exceptional in itself, and therefore that the population in the tower is much higher than the number of regulars, a number that is probably enormous. And yet it also depends on one last thing, what we define as an inhabitant of the tower. Since season 1, we have seen a great diversity of races among the regulars, humanoid or not. However, we know that animals, objects or machines are not considered as regulars, and that the laws of the tower do not apply to them, as Lopobia Yurayo explained in the Nest Ark. It can thus be assumed that only beings with a highly developed consciousness can be considered regulars or not, and thus be subject to the laws of the tower. And it is of these that I will speak in the next part. The first race to mention is obviously the human race, well I don't really have to explain what it is, it's people like us who can have different skin colors, hair colors, etc. And it's also the most common race in the tower. Some humans are also probably hybrids, like for example Endorsi with his horn, or even Ho or Wang Nan, but it's quite hard to say since this kind of elements can also be acquired in different ways and therefore not be innate. There are also some races that are very similar to humans, and we don't really know if they are hybrids or a race in their own right. Then there is another category of people that we call hybrid, it is those like Yorayo who, as I said in the video on the workshop, are mixtures between a human species and animals, objects or machines. This allows them to divert certain laws of the tower, because the laws of the tower obviously only apply to human beings, or at least to beings with a certain level of consciousness as I explained earlier. I refer you to the video on the workshop for more details. As for the other humanoid races, there are the silver dwarves and the red witches which I already mentioned in the video on guides. There is the Gweta race that has the ability to feed on flames, but also the canine race with the Baylord brothers and the people to whom they have transmitted their power. This race is divided into three categories. At the top there are the canine lords, those who have acquired the power of transformation. Then there are the half-breeds, those who were rather weak before receiving the power of the Baylords and who look more like dogs. And finally the fighting dogs who have no will of their own and therefore cannot become regular. They are more to be considered as animals finally. The details concerning the creation and the origin of this race are still very vague since it is one of the main issues of the plot between the Baylord brothers and Yasracha, so I won't dwell on it more than that. And while we're at it we can talk about the feline race, which can use a technique called animalization and which is quite close to the transformations of the canine people. From this race we can name Yasracha, Hasacha, Haracha, Kendrick Deal, etc. Then we don't have a precise name so we will call them Rabbit Ears. It is a race in which all the members seem to be obsessed by money, and those in order to save their race, as we could see it with Ziaxia, or the other regular one whose name we do not know. There are the Rashang, of which Haracha was a part, and at worst to know everything about them, it is enough to reread chapter 72 of season 3, since everything is condensed in one chapter. There are the Kukum that we can find on the 49th floor. Then if we go to the races with a less humanoid look, 
There are the Duni or the Soft Dwarves, still on the 49th floor. There are also the parasites like Medina or the green thing that was inside Yon. These parasites have a developed conscience as they were chosen by Hedon and are considered regulars. There are the Da'an, a race very present in the tower and known to be rather peaceful, even if some of them can be good fighters and are also known to hold the position of light bearer. Finally we can also mention the Wraith Razor, because in addition to being the name of Rak, it is also the name of his species. This race lived in a place where there were only turtles, and that's why, according to SIU, Rak thinks that any life form different from his own is a turtle. It is not clear whether this entire race is directly descended from the natives ones, which I will discuss later, or whether Rak is a unique case. It's also not clear if this is one of the cursed races. There are the bird races like Pompidou or Gayatang, the bee races like Vespa, the lizard races like the two Anak, the grey things with horns, or the weird green things like Paraquel or Pinnacle. Then, there are a lot of characters with an atypical morphology and probably belonging to a race that SIU didn't bother to specify. So you might as well list the characters by displaying them on the screen, it will be easier. Beware, this is going to be a festival of random characters that everyone has forgotten. There are Red Greymon, Grobin, Kranka, Yukan, Arvin Lu, the Alter Vice Director who looks like Galactic Soccer Wombas, Young Seung, Shakul, Katan, Levin, Chung Chung, Kukakura Kukakuka, Liara, Nyonawan, Jaskal, Mate, Mia, Muntari, Paula, Taro York, Water Jelly, Yule, McCage, Palgeon, First Emperor, Kesar the Furious, Deod, Baunian, Grom, Chigrinsky, Kayla, Kong, Yokim, Polo, Trio, Tura, Moguri, Tonki, Mr. Fluorescent Plastic Bag, Mule, Teb, Maddox, Madarako, Tebo and Lebo, Bloomer, The Guardian of Hell who looks like Rock, Alex, Miss Ice Strawberry's partner, Death Lady, A Monkey Man, Mr. Mole, Viviolga, Lopobia Yoreo, and one of the new divisional commanders of the 4th Liboric Corps, who is not named. Nothing more than that. We can also add all the races or people that Yasracha has taken hostage, and that forced to fight in the game, each for himself, God for all, in exchange of their freedom, like the Ewok kind, the giant insects and the giant rhinoceros man that fight Balm, or the Arlong from Wish, and the bull men that fight Yama. In addition to that, there are all the races locked up by Kendrick Deal. In short, there are many. We can also add the followers of Karaka that we saw recently. Note also that the Lopobia family has 20 branches, each one having a different animal as a theme, and physical characteristics that are often close to it, such as the feline race for example. We can also note the existence of artificial or robotic beings like the data of the hidden floor, the robot army of Lopobia Fusile, H23 or Biyuan, who helped Jinsung to blow up the ship of Kalavan with the cannon of El Robina. Finally, there are also cursed races, also called Cursed Peoples, who are the descendants of peoples who betrayed Jihad and the heads of the Ten Great Families after the Great Journey, probably to side with Arlen Grace and V, and have suffered in retaliation curses, one making them hermaphroditic and preventing them from reproducing, as for aka Williams, another one greatly increasing the risk of infant death, as for Hayura's father and Hayura herself, or one that seals their power. The Shinho, which can be literally translated as fish of the divine sea, or simply as fish of Shinsu, are creatures living in the tower and depending on Shinsu to live. So they are totally different from animals, which do exist in the tower, for example a deer on the 30th floor. SIU had moreover specified in a question answer that fish and Shinho had nothing to do with each other, since one lives in water and the other in liquid Shinsu. Moreover, as I said in the video about the positions, the combat positions were originally designed to fight Shin He and not humans. And as a reminder, there is also the anima position which allows to control Shin Hu. However, the border between Shin He and animals is quite blurred and not often clearly established, so I'm going to put everything in the same category. It will avoid me to make assumptions and potential mistakes. Let's start with the very first Shin He that we meet, the white armored eel. This is one of the most common Shinho in the tower. They usually live in environments with very dense Shinsu and can move at extremely high speeds with great agility. They are generally quite docile but become aggressive during the breeding season because they need food and want to protect their young. There is one white armored eel that stands out from the others because of its legendary status. It is the Orfish. Its fame is so great that the sword of Arie Hon, the most powerful weapon in the tower, the White Ore, is named after this Shinhu. Then there are two Shinhu known from non-canon lore, the Barracuda and the Killer Whale. The Barracuda is known as the most hostile and violent Shinhu in the whole tower and it is from him that Urek's nickname comes from, Barracuda Ray. The Killer Whale on the other hand is known as the most powerful Shinhu in the tower and will also serve as Adori Jihad's nickname to symbolize her overwhelming power. There is the Submerged Fish, a gigantic black fish, bigger than a white-clad eel. This is Yu Hansung's favorite Shinhu and that's where his nickname comes from, 
He uses it during his little fight against Lopo Biaren in Season 1. We will also see during this fight, as in the one against Yuri, that Lopo Biaren controls many Shinhu who will not have particular names. To stay in Season 1, there are all the Shinhu that we saw during the Administrator's trial on the second floor, the striped earth pigs, the barnacles goblins, and the giant earthworms they raise, the Gobi Dolphins and the Gobi Queen, and finally the Bull. All these species form a kind of ecosystem around the wine glass, but I'm not going to detail everything, you just have to reread Chapter 60 of Season 1 where the rules of the test are given. Then there is the Zijina, which I already talked about in the previous video. When they are babies, the Zijina use the jewels on their flower as food to grow up. The adult Zijina are gigantic, enough for us to enter their body anyway, and have two holes to breathe, one in the back and the other on the belly. The Zijina will therefore regularly turn around in order to tan on one side or the other. It is a sacred creature for many inhabitants of the 21st floor. Note also the presence of giant parasites inside the Zijina. There are also seals that serve as cabs on the 25th floor as well as whales that fly in the sea of clouds. Aiden Dan will also mention a silver carp on this floor because Kun made him believe that he was hiring him to capture one before offering him to join his team. Then we can recall the existence of the ancient monster that terrorized the village from which Hong Danhua and Hong Chunhua came, who was defeated and whose soul was sealed in seven sacred swords, including Krishna and Narumada, that we have already seen. I refer you to the video on all the plots to remind you all this in detail. There are the metal fish of angel who have the particularity to eat everything and anything, and not to need a jar to be controlled. To stay with fish, there is also the silver fish that Kun caught at the Dalla show, and that had the ability to compress itself. Then there is Fenril, a Shinher, controlled by Lopobia Elaine, who is actually a kind of spirit creature more than a living being, and therefore does not need a bowl to be controlled. He also uses a spell on his teeth that prevents the person he bites from healing from his wounds. We can also mention the shadow fox controlled by Lopobia Alfine. There are also the crystal shards fish-like Shinhu living in cold Shinsu. They will be seen in the train when it is on floor 40. There is also a much larger derivative species. There are the soul devourers who collect the souls of people who want to enter the floor of death. And to stay on the floor of death, we can also talk about the eye bugs, the one-eyed lizards, Yuda, or even the kite lucans. There is the treasure-eating stingray, a creature belonging to Paul Bidao Gustang, which he gave to Rachel and used to retrieve Jahad's bracelet from the hidden floor. She also has some offensive abilities, as she has been known to protect Rachel. There is also Pollock, the Shinhu controlled by Dorian Frog. It seems that she learned the word chicken from her former master, a chicken fanatic, I wonder who he is. There is the guardian of the past room in the train who looks like a giant bird. There is Mayan, a very special Shinhu, who has the ability to teleport anything to another Mayan by eating it, even allowing instantaneous passage to another floor, although regulars obviously can't get to a floor they don't have access to in this way. This is all made possible by a warp drive in his stomach. The Mayan can expand enormously, and therefore even teleport large objects like ships to another Mayan. Then there is the giant ancient cobra, with heterochromatic eyes, which I will call the big snake for simplicity, and which is a Shinhu belonging to the Lopo Bia family. During the flashback of Doan, we see the big snake fighting the group of the Hidden Grove, and will speak to them several times. Taro York will thus realize that the eighth son of the Lopo Bia family, was speaking through the big snake. He is probably still controlled by the eighth son of Lopobia and is currently in the nest near the frozen waterfall. It is also known to be one of the 23 special Shinhu belonging to the Lopobia family. We can also talk about the giant cat that is Yasracha's mount and we don't really know if it has special powers or not. To continue on the creatures that we discovered in the nest, there is the giant lemur controlled by Lopobia Didiano who will be burned by Evankel. There is also the octocrab that Lopo Bialefav uses to protect himself in close combat. There are the giant rabbits that we will see in Kendrick Deal's flashback and their rather stylish predator, which looks like a kind of chimera. And in general we can see a lot of animals in this chapter, the 77th of the season 3. And if we have to do that, we might as well add the mouse that we have to catch in the cat tower. There is the giant windbird with six wings, the Shinho controlled by Lopo Bia do Koko. It is a very powerful Shinhu that was given to him directly by the head of the Lopo Bia family, it has three forms and Lopobia do Coco will even be able to transfer his own consciousness into it after his real body has been killed by Doom. So he will die together with his creature thanks to Kun's strategy. We can also add all the Shinhu that we see in the different battles of the nest. And finally the most recent ones are the fishes present in the control room of the cat tower as well as the real crab that we find in the chapter 83 of the season 3, which is the chapter 500 in all and which will be the farthest chapter that I spoil in all the series of lore video since I would not go further in the next ones. At least this way it gives you an easy to remember cue.
Finally, there are some living beings that are quite apart in the tower that we don't really know where to classify or that are very important. To begin with, there are the native ones. As I said in the video on the history of the tower a long time ago, even before the arrival of Jihad and his companions, there was an extremely powerful giant in the tower who split into five, giving birth to what we call the native ones. These five native ones had the ability to manipulate the elements of the tower and when they did, they were surrounded by light and changed their appearance. These native ones had descendants. There are the indirect descendants, those who inherited some of the blood of the native ones and who could do nothing but transform their bodies with the attributes that were in them. We saw them at the name hunt station in particular, with Hesse who could turn into earth or his brother JM who could cover himself with metal. Then there are the direct descendants who are able to make the external elements stick to them while being bathed in a particular light. However, according to Kunedan's data, all the direct descendants of the native ones were exterminated by Jihad and the few that remained disappeared as a result of a curse. This curse is probably one of the three curses of the cursed people, the one that seals the powers of the individual and that makes Rak possess only a part of the powers of a native one descendant, and that he awakens them quite late. Then there are what we will call the ancient monsters. We have only seen two of them at the moment and we know very little about them. These are the monsters that are inside the body of Evankel and Kelhelm. We don't know anything about Kelhelm's ancient monster except that it looks like a minotaur and seems to have mastered the element of wood, but Evankel's ancient monster will tell us a little more about their nature. It is a kind of elephant that masters fire, and it will teach us in one of Evankel's flashbacks that its goal, and implicitly that of all the ancient monsters, is to survive so that their power never disappears. They don't know why exactly, but they move from host to host for that sole purpose, to survive until the time comes. We also know that their powers are limited because during the fight between Evankel and Kelhelm, he said that Kelhelm couldn't use any more power from his ancient monster because if he did, the floor administrator would intervene. Finally, we know that Rak had the impression that he had already seen the flames of the ancient monster of Evankel during the arc of the last station. We can also note the existence of demons, although the term is vague, which seem to be inside each living ignition weapon, like Horyang, Kasano, or of course Bam. We don't really know if they are more or less normal souls like the ones that can be found in ignition weapons or if they are souls only dedicated to human bodies. It is also not known if the word demon used for the demon in Kasano and Horyang means that it is of the same nature as the one in Ba'am or if it is just a misuse of language by Maddox, the researcher of the workshop. In any case, we don't know anything about their origins either. They are entities that remain quite mysterious. Note also that there is another entity called a demon and that has a priori nothing to do with them. It is the demon that gave the grimoire in which was the spell allowing Joaquin to merge with his four brothers and sisters, or rather to absorb them. Finally, there are the floor administrators which I already talked about in detail in episode 1 on the tower, so I'll refer you to that video for the details. However, there is one particular case that I didn't mention, the Red Tricia. It is a very small part of the administrator's body that survived the fight against Enryu. It will be found by Urek who will give it to Hell Joe. Then the Red Tricia will use Heljo's grudge to parasitize him, little by little, and grow, and will finally take control of his body at the end of the arc of the Floor of Death, and then will get smashed by Urek. Then he went back into Bam's body. Since then, the Red Tricia is inside Bam's body in a form similar to the blue demon he retrieved from the wine glass. The Red Tricia, although being a tiny fragment of the administrator, has more or less similar powers, including the ability to control the Shinsu, and has also kept in mind the moment when he was smashed by Enryu. His goal is to get out of the floor of death to look for him and to take revenge. Well I think I've done the whole thing, of course there must be some missing, whether it's about races, animals or Shinhe, but I tried to be as exhaustive as possible, and in any case I can assure you that I was more exhaustive than the English wiki. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it, you can like it, comment it, share it, subscribe to it, put notifications etc, as usual, and we'll meet again for the next lore video, which will be a little bit special since we'll talk about the non-canon lore which has become obsolete.